Hey guys, it's Rodimus Primal. I am back with another video and I am here with comic books legend and the guy who actually gave us the backstory technically to the Transformers, the legendary Jim Shooter. So how you doing, Jim? Very well. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope I didn't embarrass you there. No, nah, it's okay. Yeah, Sorry. it was very nice. Thank you. So for those of you who are unaware, Jim Shooter is a legend when it comes down to the comic book industry. Um, you actually started into the comics when you were 13 years old? Yeah, I wrote my first three stories for DC Comics, Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes when I was 13. Wow. And, and then turned 14 and kept going. And if anything, you probably like invigorated DC to like get their stories like in check in a way, if you think about it. Uh, no. <laughs> no, you no, don't think so? I, they, 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 uh, they knew I was trying to do a kind of a pale imitation of Stan Lee and and as Bob Haney used to, when I'd come in, he'd say, oh, here comes our Marvel writer. And they meant it as an insult. They didn't want to be invigorated. They wanted to do what they were doing. Uh, and they could not understand why Marvel stuff was selling, you know, was um, surpassing them. And they were falling. And they couldn't understand why my book, which I was trying to do continuity, trying to do, you know, like Stan did, mm -hmm. uh, not as well. And uh, they couldn't understand. Why. My, my book stayed even. My book sold a half a million copies a month. In 1965 and 66, and when I left there in 1970, was selling half a million copies a month. Wow! Uh, I guess you went, eventually went to college, mm -hmm. and then you started working at Marvel. And no uh, college, no. Okay. I just kept working. Okay. I, I I left uh, when I left DC in 1970, or the beginning of 70, I guess. I got some uh, advertising work. I'd done a couple of interviews in the Pittsburgh area for local TV, whatever. And so I got a, a call from this guy from Lando Bishopric Advertising Agency. And he says, you're the kid who does comics, aren't you? And I said, no, oh, it's me. I'm the kid who do, does comics. And so I did some I did some advertising for oh, U.S. Steel and a couple of their divisions, uh, some local places, and then also for Levi's Jeans. Well, well, then I went, I was freelancing for both Marvel and DC. Okay. And then uh, DC wanted me exclusive. And that went on for a couple of years. And then Marvel offered me a, a job as editor, not editor-in-chief, editor, which I took and then eventually became editor-in-chief. Okay. And when the big thing about you becoming editor-in-chief was like you got the books out on time. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. People got the artists and the writers, you know, better benefits and better pay. And, you know, really what you were, what was what Marvel needed. Um, and if I anything, so. it's kind of like the Dark Knight. You know, in a way, like the, when they say at the end of the movie, he's like not the hero that we need, but it is like it is what we need kind of thing. Like that was that was you yeah. to Marvel Comics. Well, I, I was I guess I was the right guy for the, the job at the time because I, I had a little bit of background that I'd gotten from Mort Weisgar and also from working in the advertising business uh, about administration and, uh, you know, organization, also making it run like a professional company and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I had a little bit of training. Mort Weisinger uh, used to always talk to me about uh, financial and managerial and, and the, you know, all this kind of printing production stuff. I'd talk to Jack Adler, whoever. And I, I asked his assistant, why is he, why do you want me to know all this stuff? And his assistant, E. Nelson Bridwell, says he's training you to have a job like his. He's always yelling at me. Why would he do that? <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, I had some solid background, and I think yeah. most of the guys before me, they were great creators, some of them, but they, they weren't administrators. They weren't mm -hmm. um, problem solvers. You know, I mean, uh, you and Archie, the smartest guy you ever met. You know, uh, he, 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 his eyes would glaze over if he had to talk to bean counters or lawyers <laughs> or you know, I mean, they, they just weren't into that. I wasn't either, but I knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. And and I, I knew how to speak to the people upstairs in their own language. You know, the one thing I understand is money. So I get anything I want done as long as I show them how we'd make money. If if anything, that was kind of like you were both being both a creative and a managerial position. You were able to really bridge that gap in a way that, you know, because yeah. a lot of the books at the time really like soared because of it you know it's true and yeah. uh the, you know the numbers were necessary so yeah it was like me and me paul levitz and will eisner i think were the three guys who really had a business background paul went to school for it uh, i learned seat of the pants and, and will's was just a genius i realized that if you know well we were dying the whole industry was dying in the first year i was editor-in-chief uh warren went out of business uh charlton went out of business harvey just stopped publishing 
Archie went all reprint, and on one day, DC canceled 40% of their line. Wow. And the only reason Marvel was, wasn't in that bad a shape was because Roy Thomas, the year before, had gotten us the Star Wars lists. And the Star Wars book alone was wow. keeping us afloat. And the Roy bought me a year uh, to turn it around. And getting things on time was a big thing. I, I, my, my deal with the president was, I mean, he, he wanted, he, he thought the, we're going out of business. He said, he said, I'm going to get us into animation, children's books, try not to lose too much money until I do get that done. I said, you're wrong. I said, this, this can be big and we can make it big. And he said, oh, blown. And, and, uh, and, and I said, well, I'm going to have to change some things. And he said, he said, do whatever you want. I don't care. You know, just try not to lose money. And I said, can I, if I beat my projections or if I save money, I want to plow that money back in. And he said, I don't care. Go ahead. Ha ha. He didn't think either of those were possible. But when I got the books on time, we were saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in late fees. It's also a lot of corruption going on, theft and double vouchering and all kinds. It was a, it was a snake thing. But, uh, you know, and I got, I hired good people. We cleaned it up and all of a sudden the books are on time. They're showing up when people come to buy them. Yeah. And, you know, and, and also I got the greatest editors. I got Archie Goodwin, for God's sake. I got uh, Louise Simonson. It's better than Christmas. I got Larry Hama's like winning the lottery, you know, and, and <laughs> lots of other good guys too. And uh, Carl Potts and Jim Salakrub and Bob Budiansky. And, yeah. and man. So, you know, uh, so we had a good team. And uh, once we got some of the big, stupid problems out of the way, then uh, they, they rocked and rolled. Yeah. And they can definitely say they rock and roll because, I mean, the X-Men comics, you know, soared, obviously, with Claremont and, you know, the, then, of course, the, the Dark Phoenix saga, which yeah. you were responsible for <laughs> the, in my opinion, the best outcome out of that whole storyline was the ending in which Jean Grey, of course, has to sacrifice herself for the crime of destroying an entire solar system. So yeah. um, how well, did that come about? Like, what was the... You know, the Genesis. Yeah, the, well, Genesis. The, the way it started was that Chris was he he was kind of stuck for a, an idea for a storyline, mm -hmm. and his editor, who I think was Jim Salakrup at the time, and I, uh, we went to lunch with Chris, a little Chinese joint downstairs, and and um, so you're just kicking, kicking things around and getting nowhere. And then I said to him, I said, Chris, I said, you know, Marvel Comics has had an awful lot of bad guys who became good guys, uh, the Black Widow, Hawkeye, the Swordsman, I don't know. I said, well, we've never had a good guy go bad and stay that way. Mm. And he said, don't say another word. I want to do this all myself. And I said, all right, fine. Then. You take it and run. So he did. And that's when they, they, they had already done some playing around with Phoenix anyway that way. And so they, they man, they built to this incredible peak. I mean, she's blowing up starships. She's blowing up a planet. You know? Wow. And, and so, uh, so anyway... I, at that time, I think Louise was the editor. And Louise did not know the origin of it. She didn't know, well, no, she only should know what Chris told her. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think he was totally honest with her. But the, the original plan that I approved was that Phoenix was going to go bad and then stay that way and become kind of the new Doctor Doom for the X-Men, wow. the, the nemesis, you know. So I don't think Louise knew that. And, and so when it was getting near the end, I went to Louise and said, uh, you know, this, this is really getting intense. Uh, show me what else you have. So she had two issues in progress and she had uh, the plot, for the last one. And the two issues were even more intense. And then the plot for the last one was total cop out. It was, it was uh, oh, the Shi'ar capture and they fix her brain. And, and she's fine now. She can go back to Westchester and be, a, be an X-Men. <laughs> what? No. I said, Chris, that's a lousy end. I said, you have an incredible story. It's an incredible buildup. And it's it's it it's just over and it's okay. I'm better now. Well, I don't think if you blow up a planet and you say, "Oh, I was, I was sick that day," I don't think that helps. You know, yeah. <laughs> nobody cares. You blow up a planet, so, and also the people, the relatives of the people on that starship are going to be a little peeved. I think. Uh, so she, I said, "There's no way she can just skate. She, can, you know, you can, and oh, it's, it's fine now. I was sick, you know, no." And so he said, "Well, what do you want me to do?" And I said, "Well, maybe she goes to the galactic prison or something." And he said, I don't like that. The X-Men keep trying to rescue her. I said, not on my watch, pal. They will not. <laughs> I said, all right, your turn. You know, you come up something. Next morning, he comes in, says, I'm going to kill her. I said, deal. You do that right. That's a great ending. He said, well, wait a minute. You can't kill her. Because <laughs> he didn't think you would actually say yes to that. <laughs> no, he, he said, I'm not killing her. You know, he was trying to bluff me. He started to back me down. Right. I said, I said, I'm not killing her. You're killing her. And he's like, ah, ah. Anyway, he runs out of the room. The next minute, I get a, a phone call from John Byrne in Alberta, Canada, Calgary. 
the first, his first words, are you out of your mind? And I said, no, I made a deal with Claremont, get to work. But <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I mean, they knew I was serious. They, they, they knew they're, they're not escaping. This. You know, uh, I mean, if I had to do it myself, there, there, there's going to be a better ending. Right. And people say, oh, is this some more moral issue with me? No, it wasn't. It was a, it's a story issue. Right? That's a stupid ending. This, you know. Anyway, so, aha. So they had to do it. And they knocked it out of the park. Did you, did you read that book? It's great. And then at the end, she sacrifices herself, like you said. She redeems herself a little bit. Wow. That book, that issue took X-Men from the uh, middle of the pack to number one in the industry where it stayed for 20 years. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. And even and even eventually like made an animated series where they, they adapted that storyline. And then yeah. they tried twice and failed to make movies out of it, which they didn't, they didn't, started on they that. Didn't do well with it. No, but I mean, I'm Chris and, and John, they, they are tremendous talents and and when i you know made him do what he said he was going to do in the first place which is make her a villain and she stays that way because she dies you know i mean they, they kill it they, they, they just it was really tremendous they did such a good job on it and uh and you know i think that uh, uh because the x-men did so well and because marvel in general did so well it was good yeah. for good for them good for everybody and of course i think the next big thing that i think that uh, a lot of people talk to you about of course is secret wars and how Black Costume Spider-Man came about, and yeah. of course the toy line, which ties in because he's Black Costume Spider-Man is right around there on the wall, webbing up Megatron from the Transformers issue. Uh, <laughs> you know, which uh, if yeah. you read, you know, when you read it, it says takes place before Amazing Spider-Man 258 because at the time Transformers was still in the Marvel universe. You know, it was a very big thing at the time, and yeah. if anything, it actually launched a lot of people who were, you know reading marvel comics into the transformers and they became yeah. lifelong transformers fans because spider-man showed up in his black costume yeah so i think yeah well it worked i mean i i i knew it would, it would cause some stir but i didn't know that over 40 years later we'd still be talking about it it's a, once again the, I, I i did the black costume i timed mattel had nothing to do with the comic book we never sent them anything for approval they didn't ask they didn't have any right of approval all they wanted us to do was get publicity so i timed the first appearance of the black kashi spider-man 252 to be in january that's when mattel had their pre-toy fair mm -hmm. and so it, and it got national media attention and so all the people who are going to mattel to decide which toys they're going to buy were watching on tv this new bangled black costume secret wars blah 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 so they went there um Primed. And then I timed the origin of the black costume issue eight for August, which is when they sell in the Christmas toys. Right. And that got a lot of fun. And I, I, you know, I mean, like, and I told the guys, the Spider-Man guys, they said, what do you want us to do with this? Um, I said, anything you want. And I said, it's alive. It's obviously alive, you know, but then do whatever you want. So they made it into a symbiote, which I didn't think was the most original idea I'd ever heard. But it was a cool idea to me. For yeah, us well, I, I told kids. I, I told them um, anything, so I wasn't going to renege on that. But at first, I thought that was not the best idea. But they, once again, just like Claremont and Byrne, they knocked it out of the park. They made it so good, and and it, it became super popular. It's everywhere, and even the the, <laughs> the licensing people called me up uh, from upstairs, like they couldn't walk down the flight of stairs. Right. But um, they, they, both of them, international and domestic, called me. And they're screaming at me. So you idiot. We have the red and blue costume licensed all over the world, and you change it? And I said, relax. Like, I can have more than one suit of clothes. You know, it's, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. So they're all mad at me. Later that day, licensees from all over the world called, and they wanted the black costume, too. They like the red and blue, and they want the one black. So I doubled their business. Not that it was my plan. Yeah, and, and then uh, Spider-Man the, toys. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and the, uh, it, was, it was so good that... Uh, the president of the company had everybody stationary. The whole company stationary was changed to black Spider-Man. It used to be like red and blue Spider-Man mm -hmm. on the letterhead and on the envelopes and all that stuff and the business cards. And he'd had it for two years. It was black Spider-Man. Yeah. Even so, like crazy enough, is like the black costume that he has there in Transformers. Transformers is a Hasbro property. And you had licensed Mattel to do the yeah. black costume, which was... They didn't like there was the toy line coming out from Mattel and there was this back and forth because I talked to Bob Budiansky about this and he said that like it's kind of funny that like the red and blue was set. You know, they said no, because Mattel was coming out with a toy line for Secret Wars. And yet. So, OK, we'll do the black and white costume. 
and yet the black and white costume is what is being sold from itself with its voice, which is kind they, of hilarious. To think I, you know, I mean, Bob Bob was on the front lines more than me, but but they didn't really give us too much trouble either on GI Joe or Transformers. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, they were really easy to to deal with and and reasonable. There's a couple little tiny things in GI Joe where they say, "Hey, could you do this?" But it was it was really a pleasure working with those guys. They were. I don't know. I mean, I think they had, well, they had tremendous respect for Larry Hama and for Bob Rudiansky. Yeah. And I mean, I guess they liked me. And so uh, we got along pretty well. Well, speaking of that, let's actually get into the origins of Transformers and G.I. Joe and how that came about with Marvel Comics. Um, and Origin, how, yeah. Okay. You know, because G.I. Joe started pretty much, they were relaunching the Real American Hero. Then they approached you, I guess, to... Um, something like that well basically uh my, our president's name was jim galton he was at some charity event and so was was it erwin erwin hassenfeld and okay. um so they got talking you know what do you do what do you do not that galton knew that much about comics but he, he knew we did comics so uh hassenfeld said that uh, they, they were thinking of relaunching some of the old brands especially gi joe but they weren't sure what they were going to do yet and so uh, Galton, who had never opened a comic book in his life, but he could read the sales figures, he said, well, you should let us do that for you. He said, we got nothing but geniuses. How do I know he said that? He quoted himself to me later. Anyway, so he tells me about this, this meeting with uh, Hassenfeld at the charity event, and, and they arranged a meeting downtown. And so Galton and I went, and they had a bunch of executives. Hassenfeld wasn't there. <clears throat> and they had um, a one-slide slideshow. They had the logo, G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, and nothing else. They had a photo <laughs> of a soldier. You know, that's it. And so we started talking about what it could be. And I, I gave them some suggestions because I, I know a little bit about toys. And uh, so among them, that it, it can't be war. It has to be anti-terrorist. And you know, the top secret unit, the best sailors, the best airmen, uh, the, the, the best uh, soldiers, the best Marines. And, you know, when there's a terrorist crisis, you call in G.I. Joe and a uh, top secret, you know, so they, they can't be compromised. Well, they like that. And they like my little slogan. We also, they had no idea how, what size they're going to be. I talked them into the Star Wars size because mm -hmm. that was the most popular. And also I was a little boy once. And if the figures are the same size, they'll have Star Wars guys fighting their G.I. Joe's. You know, they will. You know, so that's <laughs> yeah, what boys, that's what boys do. Right. You know? yeah, and, of course. And so. So anyway, I talked them into what is it, three and three quarter, three and three quarter, three and three quarter inch, yeah. And they were going to do a lot of articulation and stuff. It was it, we walked out of there, and they said, "Well, we want to do animation and comics with you, and we want to do the toys and licensing." They said, "Can you get us like a storyline?" And I said, "Yeah, you'll have it in a couple of days." And so went to the office, talked to Larry, and he was already working on what he called Fury Force, an anti-terrorist group that was the children of the Howling Commandos, right? And he'd been wow. playing around with that. Yeah. And he, he yeah, I, I knew about it. I mean, but I, so he said to me, he said, can I use some of the ideas I've been working on for this? And I said, yeah, if you want to, sure. You know, so he pretty much took it from there. And Archie contributed the Cobra Commander and the Cobra Commandos, um, everything else, Larry, you know, and uh, did a tremendous job. He, he's, he's terrific. He's ex-military explosive ordnance expert and a military historian, which people yeah. don't know. He, he can tell you all about ancient greek battles and stuff a lot of people say like the gi joe comics were like really accurate to the military in a lot of ways with stuff you as know as much they as really they tried. could be uh, given that it, it was a toy and so sometimes there wasn't room for the back end of the machine gun in the in the vehicle <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you know i'm nothing larry could do about that but uh, yeah but uh, as far as he could he made it he made it uh as accurate and, and as good as it could be i mean I, he was introducing female characters they didn't have any female toys we talked him into that the first was uh, we said well the vehicle sell why don't you put uh, make the drivers and and so they did i can't remember the name of the character you, you might there was um, cover girl scarlet cover girl. Bar okay and uh and baroness were the three well, then, okay after that then then we got them doing the baroness and scarlet and lady jane Lady J. Lady J. Lady J. Lady Something J, yeah. like that. Yep. And uh, and so uh uh yeah, and that it was it was the Transformers is different because of course the toys were already created in Japan right. and Hasbro just licensed the technology. Yeah. And uh but but still they, they didn't have any backstory, they didn't have any American names for the characters and weren't the powers and stuff were not not defined. 
the way that happened is a Hasbro exec Bob Krupas comes into my office, he's got a shopping man, takes out a car, puts it on my desk. And I said, well, that's cool. He said, watch, flip, 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 it's a robot. Flip, 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 it's a car. I said, why does it do that? He said, that's what I'm here to find out. <laughs> and, and so I wrote the original treatment for that. Now, did um, the treatment come first or did you hand that to Denny O'Neill first? Uh, um, what I did was I asked, see, when we did work like that, development for outside people, it paid really well. I'm, mm -hmm. I got a big budget for that and it paid really well. And, and so a lot of people wanted to do that. You know, they wanted to work on that stuff. And it was kind of Denny's turn. Mm hmm. And Denny has had a disdain for toys that I don't understand. Somehow he thought it was dignified to write Daredevil or Batman, but but it was something silly about writing a toy, you know, Transformers. I don't know. Anyway, I sat with him. He, he didn't know what to do. So I kind of fed him his lines. And he did a really, I don't know, a hard, he didn't have his heart in it. And the, the job he did was terrible. He just pitched that. Well, having spent, I gave Denny the money. And having spent the money, then I figured, well, I'll do it myself, you know. So yes, I did it. But there's the I think the only thing of Denny's that remained was uh, the name Optimus Prime. Optimus That's Prime, a, and I think Prowl was another name, right? Huh? Prowl was another name, and I think that one goes because when I read the eight-page story treatment, it, there, there's Pr Optimus Prime, Prowl, and then Ultar, which Ultar eventually, you know, became Starscream. So those are like some of the names that that stuck. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure that Denny came up with those though. I know Optimus Prime for sure. Okay. Uh, he might have done those too, but but he was talking to me and I guess Bob um, back then. Like I said, I didn't use his treatment at all. Maybe Bob found those names in Denny's treatment, and and uh, uh, so I wrote it, and Hasbro loved it. Again, I turned it over to Bob. Genius guy, he can do anything. He draws. He, he came writes, up with Megatron, which editor. is like one of the best names. Megatron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My my mine was Cybertron. <laughs> it okay. Megatron. Yeah. A lot of Trons running around. Yeah, I know. Right? Anyway, uh, uh, yeah. We so that's how that came to be, and then Bob just just like uh, Larry, he, he he took it and ran with it. He created uh, American names to find their powers, gave them personalities, and created new characters like uh, Circuit Circuit Breaker mm -hmm. and others. And man, they just they rocked it. Man. They did they did so well, Bob. You know. I don't know. He really poured his heart into it. I, I think he really enjoyed it. Yeah. For, I mean, at I least the first, at least the first, maybe what, five years before he, yeah. he, he uh, handed the book over to uh, Simon Furman, uh, yeah, who I took mean, over and finished the last 20 issues of the book before it, you know, uh, came to yeah. an end. And I mean, no disrespect to Denny. Denny was Hall of Fame all time. Great. Absolutely. He, had a, he, Absolutely. Had, a, he had a disdain for toys that I, did, I could never figure out. Um, just, and, people uh, have different you know, interests. The only reason he took the job is because it paid so long. He wanted the money. So again, there you, money. Go. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, it, it was fun. But that backstory that you came up with, with the whole like that they, they're they alien life forms, they come to Earth on a ship and they crash land on Earth was like really like that was like such a story rich, you know, idea that. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, they're fighting over resources, yes. which they changed that in like later Transformer series. And now, and I'm like, why and now if you think about it with gas prices at like you know close to you know three fifty four dollars a gallon yeah. you know at least in california i think maybe like eight dollars in a gallon you know the zeitgeist is the same <laughs> you know right. we're no. fighting over energy resources yes here. energy and metal because cybertron had used up the, the entire world was metal and yep it was a giant uh sort of robot world and it was, and the the storylines that continued on as Bob continued were were excellent, and and that, yeah, he got into it. He really now, did. Did you have any hands on at all with Transformers or GI Joe after you had handed it? Like once Larry and and Bob took over, were you at all hands on at all with any of the storylines or uh, as much as I was with most books? I mean, first of all, if I had really if I had a great editor, Louise Simonson, I didn't have to look over her shoulder. Yeah. I mean, I checked the books before they went out. Every once in a while, maybe make a suggestion or something, but. But uh, didn't have to worry about those two guys. And so I, me I remember when Bob was uh, creating Circuit Breaker, I remember talking to him about, or listening to him mostly. And with, with Larry, at first, because we, we were helping to develop the toys, mm -hmm. we'd have meetings with the Hasbro people. I don't know, it was every six months or something. But they would come to our, our place and they would spread out all their prototypes and things on the table. Some, sometimes there was just naked technology. They didn't know what they were going to do with it. You know, um, and... and it would jump and Larry come up with a name for it, like the jump tank. I'm making that up, but you know, he had it, he came up with names for things and he'd explain what it could be. 
Mm-hmm. And so I was there. I mean, I, I stopped going to those meetings because it was all Larry, you know, I, and he, he didn't need me looking over his shoulder. So, but I did go to several meetings where a few important things were done. One of them was the meeting convincing them to try a female character. Because I, I was telling those guys, I said, he said, well, they, uh, female action figures don't sell. I said, it's not a female action figure. It's a G.I. Joe. Okay. There you go. And, and she's she's an uh, explosive ordnance expert, for instance. That's what they're that's what they're buying. Yeah. It, it doesn't, you know, it really it doesn't matter. Got a great opportunity. Or male they, or female. they did try a couple and it worked. Yeah. You know, it, it, it worked. Also, Even in Transformers, first, too, because in yeah. the Transformers line, they did not have a female toy throughout no. the entirety of the U, you know the US run of, of Transformers toys no. uh not until the 90s with Beast Wars and there was they made a character for the live for, for the in 1986 movie and uh they made a female character and the writer for the cartoon Ron Friedman insisted that there be a female character no, there had to it's like you know, Larry populated GI Joe with with female characters as as it should be yep and 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 we did eventually talk Hasbro in, into doing some of them I think Circuit Breaker was was female, and yep. also, uh, and Bob being a good writer, he had lots of, of strong female characters. Uh, uh, but you know, it's the same thing. They didn't want to do villains. Hasbro did not want to do villains. They said villains don't sell. And, uh, and so, <laughs> yes, me and Larry, I have a shelf Larry, up there. Heroes, yeah, me and Larry and Archie, there, villains. When they were, this is when they were showing us the prototypes for the first launch, mm-hmm. and there was not a villain in it. And uh, Archie was the one who said, "Hey, you don't, you don't have any bad guys. There's no villains." And, and they said, yeah, they don't sell. And so we get into this argument. Larry, uh, the Archie says, who are they going to fight? And, and Larry and Archie and I are getting into it with them. And finally, they caved in. They said, all right, we'll do one villain figure. What you got? And off the top of his head, Archie says, there's an evil terrorist organization called the Cobra Command. There's the Cobra Commander and the Cobra Commandos. And the guy says, okay, we'll do one Cobra Commando. You know, uh, you got you, you know, got any designs or anything? Larry says, you'll have it in the morning. <laughs> and so we did and they did one figure it's one of their best-selling figures because if a kid buys six gi joes he wants six bad guys yeah you know yeah. and and so then every year it became about the new villains the treasure building or the whatever true building you know? that's that's yeah. kind of the thing like if, if you see the blue robots over there yeah they're the same robot and there's like three of them so you okay. army build you know you yeah. buy like four or five of them at the time and that's kind of how you do it yeah. Um, I found this interesting because I was reading your website, uh, jimshooter.com, and I, I found it fascinating that you were talking about how your exit from Marvel coincided also with the end of the the, the Transformers and G.I. Joe cartoons, um, even though there was not a correlation between you and them, because I think at that point, you're, you know, the Marvel and Marvel Productions relationship had strained, was that because Marvel was being sold, you know, and Marvel Productions was losing money. I found that fascinating. Do you know, I know that, you know, your exit was um, probably it's all, it's all tied together. It's all tied together. Everything seems to have like coincide with each other. Well, uh-huh. Marvel was being sold and uh, or they were trying to sell it. And the studio was doing all this work, mostly Hasbro based, you know, the, the commercials, the, the uh, GI Joe transformers and the people running the studio. Well, the guy was really, the hands-on operations guy was Lee Gunther and Lee Gunther was, he, he didn't want to be scrambling for animators every season. So he kept them on staff. It was very mm-hmm. expensive. Right. And he didn't want to um, have uh, any interference. Anyway, well, it, it comes out in the, because of due diligence during the, an attempt to sell that the studio, which Lee was running it as if there was an expectation of syndication money, you know, it's a kind of an accrual counting deal. And there, Marvel didn't get any syndicated finance. Mm. And so all of a sudden, it's like, wait, what do you, you know, the Galton, the president, he gets a phone call on Frankfurt, Germany, and he gets a phone call at our stand. And, and I, I'm in the room and I can hear most of what's said, uh, not the other side so much, but him for sure. Anyway, when they when that was discovered, he he, he left the fair. And went straight to the airport, he sent minions to pack up his stuff and ship it home and flew straight to Los Angeles and got the financial officer to fly there with him there, uh, from New York. And it was just a, a giant nightmare because it, it, he thought they were making money wow. and they were losing millions a year. So well, it, it, it came out because of the sale of Marvel that the studio was actually losing money, a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And it was it was because of they were like I say, they were 
making money one way and accounting for it in a, in a way that expected syndication right uh, money that was not coming. So that that really threw a monkey wrench in, in the, the this one attempt at sale. They did work it out, but and ended up getting substantially less money for the company. But uh, I think that they they finally sold Marvel for forty six and a half million dollars, which is like chump change. I mean, it's just, wow. what are you kidding me? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, just a couple of years later, it was sold for eighty two and a half. Which, and from my research, you you stated that it was actually because they were devaluing Marvel at the time. That's how they that's how they bought it in the first place. See, it was on this. It was uh, Cadence Industries, which owned Marvel, was a publicly traded company. Mm-hmm. Marvel was making fantastic money. All of the other Cadence companies, not so good. The only one that was doing anything was Curtis Circulation, which is a service company. So U.S. Pen and Pencil and Vitamin Quota Stores and and a Perfect Subscription Company and blah blah blah, they're all losing money, and Marvel's making money. But the the executives planned to take Cadence off the stock market, so they made Marvel a division rather than a subsidiary, not to get t- too technical, but subsidiaries have to report separately to the SEC. So you can see exactly how well or not they're doing. Right. A division does not. And so what they were doing is, is laying off all the corporate expenses against Marvel to make it look like Marvel was only making a tiny profit. We're making plenty of money, but they, they, they hid it as well as they could. So therefore when they uh, made an, an offer to uh buy back all the stock to the shareholders it looked good because it was really probably if 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 they were honest about it it was it was worth it more than double what they paid for it uh way more than double so so anyway they they got themselves a bargain because they're financial weasels uh then they turned around and tried to sell it and it accepted uh, it turned out that that you know if, if cadence was mismanaged a bit well guess what marvel was too because marvel we with the comics were making great money. The other the licensing, eh, not so much. Okay, some uh, UK a little bug break even. But uh, the studio, it was Golden always wanted an animation studio and a children's book company. Well, together his animation studio and his children's book company were losing ten million dollars a year. Can, can you imagine how much money we were making to support all these disasters? Yeah. And so we were doing fine, but they were that's that they disguised it to so that they could get, sell it or buy it cheaper. And then they were going to sell it for a lot of money and it you know, kind of blew up in their faces, all this perfidy that was going on. So they still walked away with millions of dollars in their pockets. So, you know, so six guys, six yeah. guys on split up the 40. Uh, and didn't uh, one of them like ended up buying it, using you like when you were trying to buy it, use you as collateral kind of thing or like or use that, use you as a, um, I thought I forgot. A what stalking horse. Yeah, see what happened was New World Entertainment or New World Pictures, which then changed its name to New World Entertainment. They they bought it uh, first, and then they they had the same problem that Marvel did. They had this conglomerate of losing of money losing companies. Marvel wasn't Marvel had fallen a little bit after I yeah. left. I, I'm not sure that has to do entirely with me, but but they they, they had dropped off, but they were still profitable. But all these other companies that they had were just just you know they were coughing up blood, and so and they were financed by junk bond money, which we had very high interest rate. Mm. So anyway, I, I I kept track of them in the trades. I'm just curious. And I, the, the company, uh, New World Entertainment, was losing a million dollars a day, a million dollars a day. They only had so much junk bond money. So you could tell, well, in a little while here, they have to sell something. Yeah. The only thing they had that was worth anything was Marvel. So I, I put together a team and I uh, was able to raise uh, money at a nice war chest. Our initial bid was $81 million. It's usually there's a process called ratcheting. If you get more than one bid, they pit you against each other keep doing this mm-hmm. i think we could have gone up to about 115 million which would still be cheap as far as i'm concerned but ronald o perlman was an insider at new world and he owned a 20 percent plus stake there that means you can't you can't be an owner and also be a buyer unless you have an arm's length bid you know unless you have a legit bid from somebody else then you could be a buyer so that's what happened to me usually you're given a chance to the other somebody else bids you give them a chance to reply we weren't he was just, he just, he was an insider. And, and so he just bid 82 and a half and he took it. And P.S., uh, he had, uh, uh, he, he was holding about 12, $12 million worth of absolutely worthless paper, you know, it's, it's, uh, bonds. And they redeemed them at face value. So he actually paid about $70 million from him. And he borrowed $75 million 
So he put $5 million of cash in his pocket. <laughs> I mean, the financial weasel weaselry that goes on. Wow. It's just, it's just startling. And then, of course, Jeez. Perlman, he brought in marketing people and they strip mined it. I mean, we built a huge constituency. We built a lot of loyal readers. There was a lot of single copy sales. Well, he got people buying them by the case, but that doesn't last long. And then they they went bankrupt. At the last minute, his his CEO, Bill Bevins, called me and, and said, can you fix this? And I said, yeah, I can fix it. And and so he, he said, come to my office. So I went to his office. It was up on Madison Avenue somewhere. Anyway, made a deal with him that day that I would come in as the new uh, president of, of Marvel and fix it. And uh, the trouble was that bankruptcy <laughs> happened too fast. And he couldn't get it done in time. I, I wouldn't have had enough time to make a difference anymore. So, you know, it just, uh, but they, I don't know how you take something like Marvel and just, you know, you're gonna, can I say piss it away? Because that's what they did. Yeah. Very sad. But, uh, you know, then after, out of bankruptcy, the trustee, they were, they were suing Toy Biz. Toy Biz was suing them. Toy, Toy Biz went bankrupt too. So the trustee merged them and gave them chapter seven. And then after a while, the movies started and that's what saved them. Mm. Yeah, and then they sold the movie rights to a bunch of different companies at the time, and at first, all the different yeah. until they tried to all conglomerate them. When then, of course, then Disney took over and yeah. did what they did, and you know. But yeah, at the same time, to, yeah, you moved on and did Defiant uh, Comics, right? Well, first, first I did Valiant. And, Valiant, and that's it. We we ate seventeen percent of Marvel's market share in one year, <laughs> and um, they were not pleased. Um, and XO were, Man of War is one of your creations. Yeah. We even had yeah. a video game with Iron Man. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So so, so we we had uh, we did pretty well there. I had my own financial weasels at Valiant. And so I I ended up getting out of there. And uh then I started to find. And by that time, Marvel, they hated me. Man, they they came after me. They they uh they they sued me completely spurious lawsuit. And they they lost in court. They lost. They lost big. Yeah. Because you had to win three categories to get a temporary injunction. They lost all every point of all three categories. And the and judge was little, not too happy, was he? <laughs> no, my tough little Irish lawyer lady. Uh, she she beat up six of their big you know white shoe law firm. But uh, at any rate, at, at, at the end of that, they were happy because suing me delayed a nine million dollar guarantee toy deal with Mattel beyond its window. And so that. Through. And, and it cost me three hundred thousand dollars to win okay at the end of the trial the judge calls the marvel lawyers up to his bench and he says you ever use my court as a business weapon again you will regret it he said wow. you will not appeal you will withdraw this or you will really really regret it. and so they did they withdrew the suit which is means it's, wish we had more judges like that right <laughs> well they're, yeah they're, they're, which means it's withdrawn with prejudice in other words they can't refile yeah if they don't withdraw it then they, they can always come back at you so, but it was it was too late. I mean, they they got what they wanted. They they they, they put the find out of business. So it wasn't it was a bad market too at that point. The Marvel yeah. and, and and Image and DC had done all this, you know, strip mining. All well, a this lot of stuff. that had to do, if I remember correctly, the death of Superman was right. a big. Yeah, they sold in fourteen million copies of direct market firm yep. sale, and they couldn't sell them through. Mm -hmm. So every comic book store in America, in the back, they had a box or two of these Superman books. And it couldn't give them one. You know, it's quarter bin stuff. Well, people who bought that think it was good investment. They go back to a comic book short store and try to sell it. And the guy says, well, I'll give you 10 cents for it. You know, um, you know, it, it really hammered the market. And then all these other, you know, foil, uh, stamp, die, cut, blah, 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 fancy covers. Every every issue started having somebody die, get married, or get a new costume. And if they all have collectible status, none of them. No, not stuff. collectible status. Yeah, and, and so so we were trying to just do good stories and tell them well, and we might have succeeded if if we hadn't had you know Marvel using suing us for no reason, and you know a few things have broken differently, but I, that that doesn't stop. We went on and started Broadway. If so. anything, and I and I want to pinpoint this is what you just stated right there. You were trying to tell good stories, yeah. and something else that you also have said on your on your website that I found really fascinating was that you when you were editor-in-chief you are in charge of keeping the characters in line so that they stay stay true to who they are yes and cool. also telling good stories yeah and well that, that was something that's the job yeah um that's part I, of the job is to protect those franchises i gave the guys as much latitude as i could 
I never micromanaged. I never told any writer, write like me or do this storyline that I want. Uh, the nearest they came to that was Secret Wars. I said, guys, you know, I'm going to make some changes. You're going to have to deal with, you know. But uh, the, the I never told. I mean, and a lot of people did stuff. I, I would. I would. But the burn with the She-Hulk, you know, breaking the fourth wall. I would have done that. But his editor approved it and, you know, wasn't doing bad. And, you know, so I, I tried to let everybody, you know, create. You yeah, know, and yeah. and if it, if somebody really went off the rails, then I'd say no. Usually, the editor would come to me and say, "I can't deal with this guy." <laughs> <laughs> I had, well, Bill Mantlo wanted to have Spider Man uh, father an illegitimate child. I said, uh, his editor sent him to me because he got tired of arguing. Oh. I said, "No, Bill." I said, "No, you're not going to do that." I, I said, "I said there's a whole bunch. Of, he why not? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Number one, it's out of character. Yeah, Sp- the key to Spider Man is responsibility. He wouldn't do that. He would screw up once. Yeah." Which Spider Man oh, for me? I mean, I was a heavy reader of Spider Man in the nineties, yeah. and but you know, Bob Odiansky was editor uh, of of Spider Man at the time. He's a good editor. And one of my favorite ideas was that Mary Jane and Peter Parker were going to have a child. And, yeah, that's fun. And, and I was, I, I thought that was so awesome because to me, I was a, a big reader of Mary. Like I loved Mary Jane and Peter Parker yeah, together. So it was like, you know them having a child was great but then they decided to do stillborn kill off the clone bring back norman osborne and uh uh, yeah and then then 10 years later 10 years later they erased they literally erased from 1989 through 2005 i think it was all of spider-man's continuity brought back harry osborne erased mary jane and peter parker's marriage which literally erased all the comics that i read yeah. Well. Anyway, I, I this this thing with this this bothering an illegitimate child. I, I said, look. Besides, we have we have signed contracts with licensees all over the world that has a that have a clause in them that says we won't do that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. I said, you can do your story, but do it in epic comics. Call him a rack dead man. Everybody knows who it really is. You know, and and you know, you do it there, and then you want it. You know, and and he, but he was furious. He wanted to do it in Spider Man. And I said, I said, no. I said, what happens if the it's a slow news day and the president of Union Underwear wakes up and he's reading the paper and it says Spider Man father's illegitimate child? There you go, you're under his. You know? And and so, so he storms off and he does an interview with a fanzine talking about what an evil rat I am and how I <laughs> deny him his creative freedom and all this stuff. And then when the article comes out, of course, all the fanzines were sent to the office. He knows I'm reading this, right? So he comes in and asks if he can have his job back. I said, I never fired you. I said, no, just don't do this all the time, okay? You know, give me a break. <laughs> um, but, I mean, that's my job, to protect the franchises. And, you know, other guys, every once in a while, somebody want to do something dumb. And it, it was just, I, I tried to say yes as often as I could. Uh, but, I mean, I mean, I said some yes to some things that I never would have done, but I thought, okay, fine. And, uh, but I, I, I drew the line at, uh, like, uh, transvestite bondage gear and, yeah, not in a, it's a, this thing also on a spinner rack. It has a code seal, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Had, had, had to appease it's the code. Comics, wholesome entertainment. Degree. I said, if, if there's, you know, if you think th- there would be a lot of parents who would object to it, don't do it. Yeah, anyway. and that's an interesting point there. Like you got to remember who your audience is, well, and... or who you're trying to sell to. Now, at, at that time, of course, it was the direct market, and a lot of us, you know, fans were 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 buying it. So there was a, a substantial adult portion of the market but as long as you're still attempting to sell that same book on a newsstand then you better respect the boundaries that that what parent would expect yeah i don't think doing some of these stories would have hurt any child i think you know they either wouldn't understand it or wouldn't care or you know whatever but if a parent thinks it might you you know you you have to respect that that's why in epic comics we it was all direct so um we could do more adult themes and things that's fine. And eventually the whole company went direct. So I guess no holds barred now. I don't know. They, they don't even, I don't know if they know what audience they want to sell to. I don't know. think they know what business they're in. Yeah. I mean, I, I, they're in the business ostensibly of entertainment. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be like far down on their list of uh, agenda. They, they, they want to uh, 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 preach their various social justice things. Mm-hmm. And even if you agree with them, it's the preaching part I object to. Mm-hmm. I, nobody wants it, it becomes propaganda no and i don't care if you agree with every word of it nobody wants to read propaganda right you know tell me a story how about a good story folks? i want a you good know? story and 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 then on top of that this is marvel and dc and some other companies too 
you know, they, they, they've sort of descended into, uh, I don't know, you know, puerile stuff. I mean, DC does a lot of the cheesecake stuff. That's what, that's what the book is about. It's about cheesecake, you know, and, and sirens of Gotham, the new Catwoman, And it just, just all this stuff that's, it's, you know, I'm not sure that's really where your the heart of your market is. Yeah. And, and it, it doesn't seem to be so much about, you know, tell a good story, tell it well anymore. And that's the, been the secret of success in the storytelling business for 40,000 years. And yeah. it will be for the next 40,000. We just want good stories. Yeah. And... Well, good stories with respect for the characters. You know, yeah. I mean, if people go to see the Avengers movie and they like it because it's a good story and it's, it's action packed and it's got a lot of human interest and it's, you know, it's, and it, it, it comes to an ending, you know? And, and so they say, wow, I'm going to go buy this. I see what that Thor comic is like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a girl. You know? Yes. <laughs> or, Hey, Captain America is so cool. He's a nuts. What? Yeah. I mean, it's just like no relationship there it used to be, if you had a movie or TV show, the sales, of the books would go up. Now this is not enough relationship for that. No. To happen. They they almost forget. And the other thing, I, I, a lot of that might have had to do with the distribution because the distribution was kind of like done almost through a monopoly. I think, in my opinion, and I also think that, you know, where was because if, if the movie comes out and you want to see, you want to read the comic book, you you need to be able to see a correlation in the stories. And a lot of times, you'd always see the movie tie-in. Thing is, like with um with the X Men, like the, when the movie came out, the costumes changed to match the movies like they all went black leather instead of the spandex right and uh all based on a line in the movie and it's like nah i think i would rather the the, the movies stay true to the comic book and then so when people go to the comic book they find themselves immersed in that comic book because of the movie introducing yeah. them to it I, my my point of view on that is is uh consider the, the intent of the creator you know what would jack have wanted Mm -hmm. You know, would would he have gone along with maybe a, making a cool change in a costume? Yeah, I know I knew Jack pretty well, and and you know he was reasonable. And, and as a matter of fact, he would probably say, "Oh, good, I'll design one right now." But uh, I, I try to go to the intent of the original creator as much mm -hmm. as I could. And you know, I and I do think there has to be a relationship between the movies and the books. And and when the Hulk was on TV, okay, they changed his name to David Banner because because they didn't like the name Bruce, and they they. There was a Bob Banner who worked at Universal. He had no way you're going to call him Bob. And so, all right, so it's David. And uh, they couldn't have the same origin because they hadn't been an above ground nuclear test for decades. Mm -hmm. But when you get right down to it, they got, they nailed the concept. Yep. It's yep. it's this guy, it's a scientist named Banner who was affected by gamma rays. And at times of stress, he turns big and green and smashes things. That's all you need to know. Yep. You know, they, they, they got the heart of it. You know, they got the villains. Guardians. They needed the villains, though. <laughs> yeah, well, all right. But they, they got, but the show was quite a success. Yeah. And and they, they, they got the Guardians, too. Guardians in, in their movie? Yes. They, they didn't have any of the original Guardians there, except like Drax was was, yep. was there. But it didn't matter. It's a bunch of misfit, mismatched characters who find themselves thrown together and save the galaxy. You nailed know, it. That's yep. it. And they made the Guardians of the Galaxy popular because, like, yep. of, they, they hit the nail on the, on the head with the movie. Yep. And yep. Uh, I mean, I would it's even say. Movie. Now the movie, you know, the Mario movie, you know, that just came out, that hit the nail on the head because they failed the concept back in the '90s. They told a bad story that it wasn't true to the, who the characters were, and now they do a movie, you know, years later. And I'm using that as an example, but I mean, you know, they've done that with Marvel movies. They've done that with DC. Hopefully, they'll they'll do that right right, right with DC movies in the future. But <laughs> yeah, some you know. of the DC movies, I don't know what they're thinking. But uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, I I haven't seen the Mario movie yet, but I've heard good things. I'm it's the, my kids absolutely adored it. And uh, but at the same time, what you're you have a company called Illustrated Media. Well, it's not my company. I work I I work with them. I'm not an employee, but I'm okay. basically most of the stuff that Illustrated Media does. I'm the machine that makes the product, and sometimes they hire other people too. But uh, or I I hire them for them. And uh, but yeah, I mean the guy that runs it, it's a great guy, good friend, and and you know we've done a lot of projects together some advertising mostly concept creation and script doctor and things and, and also uh we did the deal together with uh dark horse for i worked for them for, for two years so you know it depends on whatever i mean and right now we're working on uh, a whole bunch of uh, television stuff three projects going at once wow um they're paying us uh they're you know we have uh all the pieces in place does that mean something still can't go wrong oh no Trust me, things can go wrong. Yeah, but uh, you know we've got we got a 
great producer, a great director. We got statements of interest from a couple streaming services and a movie company. And um, we've got a production company, the writer. I think the only thing that you could add there, the actors. Um, and that's, that'll come, you know. I, yeah. I, I, so you got something fact, I, working that hopefully we can get some good stories again. You know? I hope so. I mean, yeah. I just, I just spent the last uh, four or five days describing the, the characters, which is to help them cast it. I don't know, we'll see what happens. Like I said, I, I've been down this road many times. I've been this close and then something goes wrong. You know, at, at the, at something you never would have expected. Just like I had a movie, I had a movie deal with the dazzling, you know, and Bo Derek was going to play the dazzling and she was the hottest thing in Hollywood at the time. Mm -hmm. It was right after the movie 10 was such a big hit. And uh, so I thought that was going to happen. It was, we had a bidding war going on in Hollywood. Uh, and then she decides she wants to have her husband direct it. And no, nobody liked John Derrick as a director because mm -hmm. he was typically over budget and late and sometimes not, not real good. So all the studios dropped out. The project never happened. I mean, wow. we thought we had a bird in the hand. We thought, oh, this is a done deal. And we're, we're getting a bidding war. Are you kidding me? You know, they're, 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 it's going to be a rich deal. So, but like I say, there's always something pops up and uh, I don't know, and I suppose it could now, but I, so far they're paying me and it's, I'm happy. Hey, you know what? You get to you get you get to still be in uh, an, in an industry that you love to do stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's not stuff. much. There's not much publishing going on. I do some, I do some small indie stuff just to keep my hand in, usually for free. Uh, and I'm working with this guy named Michael Watkins on a. He has he has had a series forever called The Guardians. It's the Guardians of something. It's not Galaxy. And uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a story with him because he's very he's a good artist, like minded. And it'll be fun. So cool. that's mostly I do it for fun. Okay. Yeah. That that's it, it. Like I said, if you're having fun doing it and you're able to create yeah. something awesome and create good stories that can keep people interested, and that's what people want. You know, we're yeah, looking I for good so. entertainment. And yeah, you know, I think so. That's that's the secret. You know? Exactly. You know, more more than the big corporate entities out there. It seems like we're all going for entertainment. We're from the in indie stuff now. Yeah, and it's it's the the thing is it's. Um, uh, the, the marketing has taken over. It's almost like Disney. I mean, they're they're very good at it. Mm -hmm. They 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 are, are tremendously successful. You can't take that away from them. Yeah. But it, but it's a an entirely different company than when Walt was running. It was all yeah. about creativity, and now it's all about marketing. And if you detect a certain similarity uh, among the uh, Pixar movies, it's because they figure out which marketing buttons they want to push. Mm. And and the same with a lot of other stuff. It's I'm a, I'm a wor little worried now about uh, Marvel because uh, Marvel was sold to Disney for $3.3 billion some mm -hmm. years ago. At first, uh, Isaac Perlmutter, Ike Perlmutter, right. uh, who had been the president of, of, of Toy Biz, well, he comes out of that deal owning a lot of stock and having a lot of clout, and and, uh, and it's a $3.3 .3 billion transaction. So he had a lot of say. And he kind of kept Disney at bay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in the movies that, you know, they had, I guess, more say, but but he kind of kept them off of Marvel's back. I mm -hmm. worked for Disney for a year, and I'm pretty qualified to say what 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 would happen if Disney took over. And P.S. They just did. They yeah. merged Marvel yep. in mm -hmm. because they got rid of Ike Perlmutter, merged Marvel in, and so I would be I would suspect that they will make the trains run on time because they do. I will sus would suspect that the, that everything will become very professional and buttoned up. And and uh, and streamlined. They, they they don't like spending a lot of money on employees, you know. Right. Um, and and the the big fear is that it will also become homogenized. Mm. You know, they'll they'll kind of squelch creativity. And I'll grant you a lot of the creativity I, now. I think is going in the wrong direction. You know, you got really brilliant artists and and some some very very you know capable smart writers who are doing wrong headed stuff and not telling a good story and not mm -hmm. telling it well. You know, they're on, they're all off on their agendas. And no one seems to be steering that ship. Um, nope. So I don't know. I mean, Disney might fix some things and destroy others. Yeah, uh, we'll see. We'll see yeah. what they do. And at the same time, I mean, your hands are technically on it and yet off of it at the same time. And so, it, like I said, you you have a hand at least in, in creating something new and awesome already. So, you know, at least, yeah. there, at least we have that to look forward to. Huh. And, yeah. uh, 59 years later, I'm still involved with comics and the comics industry somehow. And we're all thankful for it. I'm telling you. Well, I'm like, thankful. Yeah, I really do. I, and I have to say, it's been a pleasure actually talking to you. 
Um, Thank you. So it, it's uh, you know, and 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 hearing like like all of this this information, some of it, some of it, I I I, I like to you know bring to to my channel to the people who have, have not heard it before, but also at the, at the same time to the people who want to know like, hey, what's what's the legendary Jim Shooter still up to today? And, mm-hmm. and uh, but we we, we I think. Uh, and any, everybody who's a Transformers fan really owes you a, a, a debt of gratitude and for what was done for X-Men and for Thanks. every one of the books that for the talented artists and writers. And and uh, so I can't begin to express my gratitude for that as well. well. Thanks a lot. And I have to say, I mean, I, I, there are a lot of ups and downs along the way. There's a lot of bumpy patches in the road, but uh, um, all in all, it's been a great ride and so, it's still going on. I'm going to end this interview here, uh, but uh, thank you very much for those, those of you thank who you. Uh, watched, st- stuck by for the interview. And uh, as always, guys, until next time, till all are one.